The sermon today is based on Lord's Day 19 of the Heidelberg Catechism. We've been teaching from our confessional statements in the morning services for the last few weeks in this church. One of the confessional statements in this church that we hold to as a church is called the Heidelberg Catechism. And it has 52 sections. Today we're on section 19 called the Lord's Day. And we're going to read question and answer 52. We can read that together. What comfort is it to you that Christ will come to judge the living and the dead? In all my sorrow and persecution, I lift up my head and eagerly await as judge from heaven the very same person who before has submitted himself to the judgment of God for my sake and has removed all the curse from me. He will cast all his and my enemies into everlasting condemnation, but he will take me and all his chosen ones to himself into heavenly joy and glory. Thus far, the reading of God's, or the Heidelberg Catechism, rather. Brothers and sisters, Today we come to Lord's Day 19, and particularly Lord's Day 19, question and answer 52, which is about the return of Jesus Christ. This, of course, is a great question. We know Jesus lived on this earth. We know he died and rose again, and then he left. And is this Jesus going to return? Is he going to come back? Does he care about us? Does he abandon us? It's a great question. And ultimately, the substance of the Christian faith in 2022 AD, the substance of your faith is that he will return. It's one thing to believe in a historical event that occurred in the past. It's yet an entirely different thing to believe the promise that something will happen in the future. And the great promise of Scripture... Really no different from the promises of the Old Testament that Jesus would come the first time. The great promise of Scripture is that Jesus will return to this earth again a second time. And what's fascinating is that his return is tied to something else. Look what happens. Look what it says in the Apostles' Creed. Jesus Christ will come and what will he do when he returns? He will judge the living and the dead. We sort of think, well, I like the return part, but I'm not so sure about this judgment business. What does that mean? Today we're going to learn under this theme about the judgment and the return of Jesus. Our theme will be the great returning judge declares us innocent if we believe. We'll see number one, the second coming, and number two, the judgment itself. Now let's start with our first point about what exactly is going to happen when Jesus returns. I have a couple of points I want to go through here. Number one, Jesus will return, but we do not know when it will occur. Jesus says to his disciples in Acts 1 verse 7, he says, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 2, you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And it's funny, if you read Matthew 24, you realize that Jesus says that even he doesn't know when he's going to return. Look at this, he says, verse 36, that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Very curious. And and Jesus makes a a related comment later in that passage where he says, if somebody says that they know when I'm coming, they are a false teacher and you should know them as such. That in itself disqualifies a teacher. Number two, even though the end is a surprise, there are signs of its coming. This is often controversial, but here's, I'll give you, there's two main signs of the coming of Jesus. Number one, Matthew 24, verse 18. 
This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. It's curious, isn't it? There is a sense in which the gospel must be preached to the whole planet, and, and, and the words are all nations, so all people groups. It's probably the best way to say that. So the, God, the, the end will not come before the gospel is preached to every nation. Now how literally or how strictly should we understand that? That's up for debate. But the point is that the kingdom will, will be preached as a testimony to the whole world in some way, shape, or form. And some mission agencies take that rather seriously and they, they've actually listed a number of people groups that have not been reached with the gospel and they sort of assert that if those groups are reached, the end will come. Perhaps. There's also sign number two. Sign number two is what we call the Great Tribulation. There will be a time, a great time of upheaval before the end. Heightened persecution. There will be some sort of revelation of what's called the Antichrist. I'm not going to get into that today. There's more to say about that. And there's some type of falling away of Christians. The two passages, if you want to look at this more, Luke 17 and 2 Thessalonians 1 speak of this. Lots could be said about this, but I want to say now is this. If you read scripture carefully, what you discover is that this final time of upheaval before the end is not in, in essence different in character than what comes before it. With the final tribulation, in many ways, it seems to be an intensification or acceleration of the persecution and upheaval that we already experience. And in that sense, the day of the Lord will still be a thief in the night. Because the tribulation will be this intensification. It, it won't, in a sense, shock us. We've already seen tribulations already. Number three. Jesus will return in the way that he, he left. Just as he went up, so he will come down. Matthew 24 says it like this. He says, look, and listen. Immediately after the distress of those days, so here you have an echo of the, the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. It's funny, the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see Jesus because they know the jig will be up. And then there's 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 6, which adds a little more information. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. So the whole world will, earth will see Jesus coming from heaven in this majestic glory. And this time when Jesus comes, he will not put his glory to the side. He will come in the fullness of his radiance and glory, unlike the last time. And let me tell you, when Jesus comes in his glory, there will be no person who does not understand what is occurring. It must be so. Number four. The dead in Christ will rise first, their souls being reunited with their bodies on this earth, and will be gathered to Jesus with those who are alive in Christ on earth. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4. The dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. It's fascinating that the Christian dead, whose souls have been living with Jesus in heaven, will then come down to earth, be reunited with their bodies, and meet Jesus in their full self. And Revelation 20 gives this interesting side note on this. It says, look, the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. And so you have the, the, the righteous and the unrighteous coming to meet Jesus. Now we'll get back to that in a second. But fifth, Jesus will return once. When he returns, all things will end 
This earth will be burned with fire and it will be rebuilt into the new earth. Unlike what some argue, there is no scriptural evidence for multiple ages in the future. And theories such as premillennialism try to argue for such things. I think those theories are based on a misreading of one chapter in the Bible. And it violates the principles of biblical interpretation, which is that all passages in the Bible have to be interpreted in the context of the whole scripture. And what premillennialism does is it postulates all sorts of ages in the future based on the reading of Revelation 20 and one particular part of Revelation 20. But if you read Revelation 20 in the context of Revelation and the Bible, it doesn't work. So, our first point. Jesus will return in glory just as he left. Certain things will occur before he comes. We do not know when he's going to return. Only the Father knows. And he will return once and this world will end. Everyone will be judged when that happens. And the new eternity will occur, begin at that moment. But perhaps the more difficult part of this is that Jesus is going to come to judge. This is our second point. Jesus is going to put everything right and he's going to have everyone give him an account for what they've done, Christian or not. Every single person will face his maker and it will not be that what you've done on this earth will be ignored or forgotten. In fact, you will have to face what you've done. You'll even, and, and I, I want to say right off the bat, we ought to reflect on the fa this fact for a second. Every single person is going to meet his or her maker. Which means, you are not the only judge of your life. Westerners are famous for thinking this way. I am the only judge of myself. I judge what I do. No one else gets to tell me anything. Everyone else's job is to support me. You know, it's their... The world is oppressive, and, and if they only let me live my own truth, then... No. Never forget that everything that you... That you will face a person who is perfectly righteous and he will judge exactly what you've done. No matter how important you think you are or how rich you think you are or how powerful you think you are, you will face the facts. It says in Matthew 25, verse 32, all the nations will be gathered before them and he will separate the people one from another. Everybody, each individually. Revelation 20, verse 12 comments more on this, and it says, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. And of course, the great question that we ought to ask ourselves at this point is, okay, so we're going to be judged. But on what principle am I going to be judged? What's the dividing line between being given eternal life and not? Now, before I answer that particular question, we first I wanted to, there are actually two principles of judgment. And I've alluded to already, there's a principle number one of what you've done, and there's principle number two of whether you believe the gospel. Now, before we get to the gospel, let's talk about what we've done. First of all, our life and our work will be judged. And, and there's three passages I want to share with you on this point. Number one, our thoughts and our motives will be judged. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 4, verse 5. Paul says, My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness. And listen, will expose the motives of the heart. Here you have the apostle of God saying, Wow. Wow. I know there will be a day when the motives of my heart are examined. And he's concerned about that. Number two, our words will be judged. Matthew 12, verse 36. I tell you, this is Jesus speaking. I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. 
And then our actions will be judged. Romans 2, God will repay each person according to what they have done. Those who, and then to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. And so, even Christian or not, your actions and thoughts will be judged. I think many Christians, we, when we think of judgment, we just think of the salvation part. We know it will end well for us, but we forget the fact that we live under the eye of God. We tend to think that we're saved and that's all that matters. It's not the case. The Bible does not talk about that way. The Apostle Paul is constantly thinking about what the Lord will, 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 will think after his, when he meets his maker. And Jesus talks all the time about this. And so I think one of the points we have to draw is that salvation is not all that matters. It's obviously massive to be saved. But how we live our lives as saved people is of grave concern to Jesus. So much so that there will be an accounting of how we lived even though we're saved into eternity. Now, before we get to the grace, I want us first to think this through. When you walk out of this worship service and you talk to people in the lobby and when you go out and live with your wife or your husband or your kids, do you think about what God thinks of that? Do you care? Do you know what God thinks of it? Have you tried to investigate what God would say about it? You are not the only judge of how you live. Now, that is not to say that we live as Christians out of a fear of punishment or out of terror. We, we, we all constantly think, well, God might punish me. No! God will not punish Christians on the final day. We don't do certain things or not do certain things out of a fear of reward or punishment. The grace of the, the final judgment for us is that we will not be punished. Yet, there's still the motive of pleasing our Father in heaven and being concerned with him and his kingdom. And to, to recognize that even the, the actions of our daily lives are important enough to warrant a conversation with Jesus on the final day. And then there's also the comment that Jesus makes, and we're not sure what to make of this, but that he will reward those who serve him faithfully. And by that reward, he doesn't just mean eternity with him. Now, ultimately, this principle of what you've done is not the standard by which you will go to heaven or hell. Not as Christians. And you might say, well, you know, it's okay that God judges my life as long as the standard is low. People often say, and this is the, the most said thing in, in uh, let me say it this way, in Northwest Brampton, this is the most said thing to the pastor. This is what it is. We're all human. We can't expect too much from each other, right? Because, I mean, I'm not a bad person because I, 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 I do some good. And so, the judgment is not so terrifying if the standard of who gets to go to heaven is like really, really low. Shouldn't God be understanding of, of how weak we are? Well, what is God's standard for who gets to go to heaven? Or, well, who gets to live on the new earth? What is, what is the standard? Well, Matthew 5 verse 48. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Hmm. 
Jesus says that the standard of righteousness is total perfection and sinlessness. That's who gets to go and live in eternity. In fact, Jesus says earlier in that chapter, he says, you know, your righteousness must exceed the Pharisees. The Pharisees are the most religious people that have ever lived. Now, if, if perfection is the standard. Now, some people might say at this point, they might have an objection. They might say, well, you know, not everybody has heard about Jesus' law. So how can they be judged according to a law that they haven't heard? How can they be told to be perfect? They've never even given a, a chance to, to live according to, to Jesus' commands. But Jesus, or The Apostle Paul says in Romans 2, he says something interesting. He says, look, all who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. What does that mean? Well, let's keep going. They who sin apart from the law. So these are people who have not heard the law. They don't live according to the law of God. These people, verse 15, show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. Their conscience is also bearing witness. Their thoughts sometimes accusing them and at other times even defending them. Which means even a person who has never heard of God's law, their conscience already accuses them of the evil that they do. And so not hearing about the law is no excuse on the day of judgment. I still stand condemned before Jesus whether or not I've heard of him or not. Ignorance is, is no excuse. Now, here's the next point. We can go back to the idea of lowering the standard. Maybe God should say you're, you shouldn't have to be perfect. But that's not in your best interests for God to lower the standard. You do not want to enter eternity with people who are mostly sinful still. That's not eternity. That's a new version of this earth. That is not what you want. You want an eternity without sin. So why would you compromise the entry standard now? So we're left with the problem. We have to somehow become sinless in this life in order for Jesus to declare us righteous on the final day to meet the standard to go into heaven or the new earth. And it gets even worse. I mean, the consequences of failing to be perfect are extremely high. If even one motive or thought on your part is crooked or wrong, what's the consequence? Well, listen. Romans 2 verse 8. For those who are self-seeking, who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. We read in Matthew 25 verse 46. Eternal punishment. And you think, man, what a crazy religion to suggest that we should all become perfect, that that's the standard for eternal life. How can God possibly do that to us? What an unfair God. We have to sit on that for a little bit. Why should we sit on that? Well, listen. It is the default mode of the Christian, or the human heart, and also I think the Christian heart often, to think that what you do will determine what God says to you on the day of judgment. And it is a lie. God will care about your actions, but that does not determine which place you go. Because there's another principle based on which God is going to judge you. What is it? Well, John 3 verse 36, look at this. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. The gospel is that God has changed the goalposts for entry into eternity. The gospel says there's a different principle by which you will be judged than that by which you, what you do. And that principle is, do you believe in Jesus Christ? 
And not just that you believe in him, but you believe the right thing about him. You see, you deserve eternal punishment for your sin. But Jesus, the judge, the man who's going to judge you, came to earth before the judgment. And he took God's wrath for your sin onto himself by dying on the cross. He paid the punishment. He satisfied the scales of justice. So that the punishment you deserve, eternal punishment, would be placed on him. And now, when he sits on that throne, he's going to come back, he's going to judge heaven and earth, and he's going to sit on that throne. And one of two things is going to happen. He's either going to offer you the sacrifice that he made on the cross, or he's not going to do that. And if you don't get that sacrifice this perfect sacrifice of a perfect man who lived a life you could never have lived, if you don't get, get that sacrifice to stand in your place, you will be condemned. But think about how amazing this scene will be. Here you will have the Lord of heaven and earth and all of his radiance so bright that the whole earth will instantly know about his presence. And he will be sitting on his throne judging each person. And when you as a Christian stand before him, he will say, hey, you knew me. I knew you. When you were on this life and everybody doubted me, you believed in me. You believed that what I said to you was true. And because you believed that, I now offer you, some, you my body. And you will see the holes in his hands. And the judge will declare you innocent based on his own testimony. you think about that for a second that is your hope the hope is that the judge will say you believed in me you believed that what I said was true you, you took my offer and now I give you myself and the Bible's great gospel answer is that all you must do is believe that he actually did it for you that is the principle of judgment no matter how bad you were, no matter how many dumb things you did, how many people you hurt in this life, no matter how many people you tortured or, or whatever, or murdered or whatever, as long as you believe that Jesus Christ forgave you by offering his body, at that final day, he will look at you in the eyes and say, come with me to my right hand. Now, it's funny, you know, it goes a little bit further than that. Earlier we read Matthew 25, verse 31 through 46. And in that passage you have Jesus explaining what's going to happen at the final judgment and people go to the right and they go to the left. And the dividing line is given in verse 34 and it's a bit expanded on faith. It goes like this. He says to those who are going to his right to heaven, he says, listen, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Why should they come and take the kingdom, the inheritance? What, what, is it, what is it? Well, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And you sort of think, well, hold on. It seems as if faith is not the dividing line between heaven or hell. But what Jesus is getting at is he's saying, listen, faith is not a lifeless thing. Faith is something that fills you with life. When someone believes in me, it means that I know them and fill them with myself. And Jesus in this passage utterly destroys the idea that faith can simply be knowledge in your head. He doesn't even consider that as worthy of his grace. His point is, listen, if you put your faith in me, then you would have known me. And that would have changed you to begin to do things like I do them. And here you get a bit of a, a difficult biblical teaching that's not always easy to grapple with. And, and 
every passage, this is, I was reading in preparation for this sermon, reading all these passages on the final judgment, and every single one, the apostle or Jesus uses the concept of a final judgment to, to urge ethical change now. And as your pastor reading this, I did not like that. Because if that's true, then I need to change too. I kind of like being what I am right now. But again, every single time, it's, listen, I'm going to judge, and you ought to take that seriously now. And there is a certain amount of, like, and you know, it says in the Bible, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And, we, you know, we, we sort of expect God to comfort us at every turn, and, and he does. But there's also a sense of, like, take this seriously. There's sort of a, the judgment is preached to awaken people to the seriousness of their condition. Now, you might say, and here I can hear the objection from many people, especially if you're here today and you're saying, I'm not sure if I'm a Christian. How can, isn't it so unfair to simply condemn people to hell? Well, recently I've been reading a book called Dante's Inferno. It's a medieval work of literature in which Dante writes about what he thinks hell is. And the translator of Dante into English, his name is John Chiardi, was one of the translators. He's not a Christian. And yet he says something fascinating about the book. Now listen carefully. He says, look, on one level, Dante writes of hell as a literal place of sin and punishment. The damned are in hell because they offended a theological system that enforces certain consequences of suffering. So Chiarity says, of course it's unfair. It's just a theological system. This isn't God talking. But then he says this. He says, look, part of that theological system has also decreed that salvation was available to all men. Christ in his ransom has procured endless mercy. One need only wish to be saved, and he will be saved. He may have to suffer at length in purgatory, this is in Dante's conception, but once there, his place is reserved in heaven, and he will in time arrive there. So when people, people often say, well, hell is unfair, well, the truth is that salvation in heaven or in, in the new earth is available to every single person. What's unfair is that people reject it for ridiculous causes. Why reject the gospel? There's no real good reason, is there? Well, I prefer atheism. Really? Why? Have you even investigated the gospel? This is what I say to most skeptics. Investigate Christianity before you reject it. It will survive the test to which you put it. Atheism will not. Now listen, he keeps going. He says, it follows then that the only way to get into hell is to insist upon it. One must deliberately exclude himself from grace by hardening his heart against it. Hell is what the damned have actively and insistently wished for. Thus, allegorically, hell is the true goal of the damned. Like addicts, the damned both hate and love their self-destruction. They yearn for that which they fear. This man, this man is not a Christian, and he sees the issue exactly as it is. People who go to hell want to be there. They definitely don't want to be in a heaven where Jesus rules. What we actually want is a heaven where Jesus is not there. But we as humans need to realize that a heaven without Jesus is actually hell. The only thing that's good about heaven that makes heaven good, that makes us good in heaven, is that Jesus is there filling us with his own life. Which is why in Matthew 25, Jesus says, if you haven't offered a cup of water to the lowest person in need, if you haven't been compassionate to those who are suffering on this earth, heaven will make no sense to you.
Heaven will be confusing. You won't even want to go there. And ultimately, the human rejection of Jesus is to say, I'll take my chances with hell. Thank you very much. It's very rare that someone investigates Christianity top to bottom and then says, no, this is, this is ridiculous. Some people do. But if you investigate it and you take it seriously, the question must be answered. I'm going to reject this and prefer hell or I'm going to take the chance that there is no hell, in which case you just die. And so the Christian question ultimately is not whether I can become righteous enough to stand in the judgment or whether Jesus, well, I should say it differently, Ultimately, the question before every human being is to believe in Jesus Christ that what he says is true or to reject him and take our chances with the alternative. It's a terrifying question, isn't it? It's funny that they say that one of the great revivals in the U.S. was sparked by a sermon from Jonathan Edwards. Sinners in the hand of an angry God. And when Jonathan Edwards said, you know, Jonathan Edwards was a terrible preacher. He, he, he got in front of the church and then he would say, he would just sit there and he would, he would, he would bend over his, his manuscript like this and he would just read the words without even looking at anyone. And yet this man sparked a great revival. Why? He preached this sermon and this is the sermon where it all started. And what was the sermon about? Basically he was describing Christians as dangling like spiders over a fiery lake of hell. And Christians are dangling there about to be dropped in. And so the congregation sat up and went, whoa, we better change now. That's the force of the final judgment on us today. Now you might say, well, where's the comfort in this? Well, there's massive comfort, in fact. Look at what the catechism says. And here's the, here's the comfort of judgment. In all my sorrow and persecution, I lift up my head and eagerly await as judge from heaven the very same person who before has submitted himself to the judgment of God for my sake. And what? Has removed the, all the curse from me. God curses us because of our sin, but Jesus removes that. Your great comfort in this sermon is that the judge sat under the judgment of the Father. The judge who judges those was already judged. And he endured the judgment even though he was innocent. In fact, even an earthly judge, Pontius Pilate, declared Jesus innocent and yet he went to the cross anyway and suffered the full wrath of God. And he did that so that on the day of judgment, when we come before the judge, the judge will say, you can be innocent based on what I did. We are going to be granted innocence based on the innocence and sacrifice of the judge. And so as we dangle over that fiery pit of hell, on the final day of judgment, Jesus will pull us up, catch us with his hand, and place us in eternity with him. And he has paid the cost to make that happen. And so yes, the final judgment should inspire some fear, some awakening in us, some quickness to our hearts and, and most importantly to our growth. Some of us sit refusing to grow. We're offered things like counseling or discipleship and we don't even want it. This passage ought to shock you. Get going. But yet the comfort is far greater. The comfort is Jesus will be there on the final day to give us the very thing we need. And evil will be destroyed. Those who inflict cruelty in this life will be completely destroyed. They will answer for what they've done. But you will not if you believe in Jesus Christ. And therefore, we ought not to fear that great day because he's going to be there on that day. He's not going to forget his own death because his own hands will bear the mark of proof that you should go to the right. And the judge will be one of us. He will be a human being. And he's not going to forget his own death when he looks at you. 
And, and so for those of us who believe, the judge will become our vindicator, our savior. Amen.